I love the Bible because the Bible is honest. I love the Bible because the Bible is real. The Bible does not hide, cover up, or try to sugarcoat the difficulties and even the tragedies of this life. This life which we live in this fragmented world. I love that because this world in which we live is sometimes incredibly painful. We live in a world surrounded by poverty and economic pain. We live in a world where the rich take care of themselves while taking advantage of the poor. We live in a world where so-called so Christians, even Christians who attend church every Sunday morning, are some of the meanest, most evil people we know. We live in a world where our loved ones suffer with all sorts of dreadful, painful diseases. And we live in a world where we are continually reminded of our own mortality. Thus I love John 11. For here in this very honest chapter, there is no denying the harsh reality of this fragmented existence we call life. Especially in dealing with the most tragic aspect of this life, the death of a loved one. Too many Christians, for too many reasons, would rather treat the tragedy of death as if it did not exist. We don't like talking about it. We don't want to talk about it. And we go to great lengths to deny the harshness, the sheer austerity of it. We don't even like to call it death. We would rather call it passing away. We say things all the time like there are worse things than death in this world. However, in death there still exists an inex inescapable starkness that cannot be denied or ignored. When we are honest, we would, would admit that death is the most difficult thing about life. Losing someone we loved is the worst of all human experiences. We try to comfort ourselves by saying things like, at least our loved one, well, they are no longer suffering. At least she is now finally at peace. But if we are honest, just a few moments later, we find ourselves questioning why she had to get cancer and suffer so much in the first place. Why did she have to die as young as she did? And then we like to comfort ourselves by saying that he or she is in a far better place. But then just a few moments later, we question why he or she would not be better here with us. What was so bad about it here with me, here at home, surrounded by family, her children, people that she loved and adored? Yes, in John 11, there is no refuting the stark reality of death. Notice that Martha is absolutely horrified when Jesus commands the stone to be rolled back from the tomb. Her horror reminds us of something that we would rather ignore. The body was begin beginning to decay. The very sound of the words of verse 39, which Martha read, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead for four days, seems inappropriate for Martha O'Banion or anyone to read in a worship service. Dressed in our Sunday best on a beautiful spring morning, we don't want to hear that. 
But this is reality. This is truth. And sometimes the truth is we really do not want to hear the truth. And sometimes we think it is our Christian duty to ignore the truth. To be an example to the world, to the weak, to the unfaithful. How strong, how to be strong, how to put on a brave face, how to hold back the tears. But notice in John chapter 11, there is no holding back. Mary, the brother of Lazarus, weeps. The mourners who had gathered at the cemetery that day weep. Even Jesus himself weeps. The harsh reality of death and grief is evident everywhere. And we are told twice that Jesus was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. Is there really a difference there? That's like saying that Jesus was grieving and mourning. I believe John is just trying to, to get across just how painful this was to our Lord. Just looking at the tomb of Lazarus caused Jesus to burst into tears. Think about that. Even Jesus, even the one that we talked about last week who is the incarnation of God, the very manifestation of God, the embodiment of God in the flesh, the creator of all that is, does not remain calm and serene as one unmoved and detached from the fragmented human scene. Jesus himself is deeply disturbed at death's devastating force. There is no denying it or escaping it or muting it. Neither is there any dressing it up with euphemisms like passing away or gone to be with the Lord. John 11 also points out the reason that Jesus wept, the reason that Jesus grieved. In verse 36 we read these beautiful words. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. It has often been said that the only way to miss pain in this life is to miss love in this life. I don't know how many of you Okies have ever heard of a man called Garth Brooks. Born in Tulsa, raised in Yukon. Garth Brooks sings a song entitled, The Dance. I should have asked Randy or Chuck or the band or someone to play this song today. Hindsight being 2020. Is it too late? Probably. Next year. One line of that song goes. I'm not going to sing it. I could have missed the pain. I could have missed the pain, but I would have had to have missed the dance. Grieving only means that we have loved as our Creator has created us to love. The only way to never grieve is to never love. But to never love is to never truly live. As the song goes, the only way to miss the pain of loss is to miss the whole dance of life. So I believe John 11 and Garth Brooks gives each of us the permission this morning to grieve. May we grieve long and deeply. May we dare not run away from it. May we never treat it as some stranger that we could send away or deny that grief because someone who doesn't know any better means, thinks, mean, thinks it means, if we grieve means our faith is somehow weak. Let us grieve what we have lost. Let us grieve honestly, lovingly, and patiently. Let us grieve until our cups are emptied. However, 
And here's the good news for all of us this day. As the Apostle Paul reminds us in his letter to the Thessalonians, those of us who call ourselves Christians should not grieve as others who have no hope. As Christians, our grief is real. But our grief is different. Our grief is not despairing because as Christians we possess hope because Jesus who himself was not immune to grief and even death is also the one who brings resurrection and new life. Those of us who are not, who are not immune to grief and death need to again hear Jesus' prayer which came in a loud voice Lazarus, come out. I heard a preacher once ask his congregation, you do know why Jesus said, Lazarus, come out, don't you? He specifically called Lazarus' name, and he didn't just say, come out. Because if he did not specifically say, Lazarus, come out, then every tomb in Jerusalem would have opened that day. We need to hear that voice. We need to hear this voice call our names and see this very real and foul, decaying corpse walking out of the grave, still wrapped in burial cloths, coming at the voice of Jesus to life. And then I, begin, I believe we need to hear again and hear again loudly Jesus' beautiful words, unbind him. Unbind him and let him go. Lazarus is loose from the bonds of death. He is freed from the shackles of his past. He is let go into a brand new future. Liberated, set free. Then I believe we need to hear John and Jesus himself tell us over and over that this event reveals the glory of our God. What we have in this story is so much more than the resuscitation of one dead corpse by one man. Always for John, miracles are so much more. Miracles are always signs that point to something greater. Thus, this miracle is the revelation that the God in whom we serve and trust and love, this God, who is not unmoved and detached from the human scene, is always a death-overcoming and life-giving God. The good news that we need to hear this morning is that this God is still working in our world today. This morning, right here in this place, unbinding, letting go, loosing, freeing, God is enabling us to confront death and grief, helping us to acknowledge it, to look it straight in the eyes, to see it for all of its darkness and harshness, and then be liberated from it. And if God is here this morning liberating us from the shackles of death, then there is nothing else in all of creation from which God cannot set us free. From evil bullies bent on crushing our spirits, from a job that is draining the very life from us, from a relationship that is killing us, from fears that paralyze us, disease that is destroying us, economic hardships that never seem to end, from depression that never lets go. One of the greatest things about being a pastor, and there are many great things, is how I have the awesome privilege as a senior minister to witness this good news all the time. someone loses their job. And they come to me as their pastor, believing that it's the end of the world, 
But a year later, sometimes sooner, working a new job, they share with me that losing that job was the very best thing that happened to them. Someone else comes to me and says that their marriage has fallen apart. And they are partly to blame, they say. They said that they thought that, as, that life as they knew it was over. But a year, maybe just a few months later, they tell me that they are beginning to realize that although they could not go back to the good old days, they have plenty of good new days ahead of them. Someone comes to me sharing their deepest fear, the fear of being known for who they really are, the fear of rejection and ridicule. Then I see them a short time later, and they tell me how they have been shocked by unconditional love and unreserved acceptance. People call me as their pastor to share their doctor's grim diagnosis. They say that they have just received a death sentence. But a short time later, I visit with them, and they tell me that they're beginning to understand that being alive and being whole have very little to do with physical well-being. And then I have visited countless people as they were facing what is certainly their final hours on this earth. But I hear in their voices and I see in their eyes a faithful awareness that there is nothing at all final about them. Thus, like Lazarus, in this incomplete and fragmented world where death, divorce, disease, and hate can entomb us, we can be loosed. We can be freed and we can be unbound. We can come out and let go and celebrate the good news together where there is incompleteness and brokenness, there can be wholeness. Where there is tyranny of the mind, there can be freedom of the heart. Where there is imprisonment of the soul, there can be liberation of the spirit. Where there is grief and despair, there is hope. And where there is death and mourning and even decay, there is always life. Let us pray together. O oh God of new life, may we be a church that shares this good news with all people, honestly and truthfully and faithfully. May we weep with those who mourn. May we be deeply moved with those who are afraid. And may we be deeply disturbed in our spirit with all who are suffering. Oh God, may we stay beside them as you stay beside them. May we befriend them, accept them, love them. Until they are whole. Until they are liberated until they are fully alive now and forever through Christ our Lord. Amen.